as I was saying yesterday, John, John was saying, uh, because some computer broke yesterday, he said, get a Mac. I said, well, my Mac crew said, get a Mac. So, <laughs> <laughs> my, you see, this, this is a uh, MacBook Pro, which does freeze. Well, uh, conference, and I, I agree with what Matt has said before, it's extremely stimulating. Uh, Sometimes when I work on my, my kind of, it sounds loud, is this so loud? No, 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 no. It's too loud. Is there like a, it's not too loud? It's perfect, I just don't, okay. <laughs> I'll speak or something. Um, you know, when I work on my kind of, uh, in Chicago, I feel like sometimes a little isolated, but uh, should have this conference like every uh, every month or something, it'd be wonderful. Um, <laughs> So I guess it's strength in us. Doing something stupid as usual. Not responding. That's no no good when it does that. I'm telling you, I'm probably the only one who has a Mac that has so much trouble with this. <laughs> Microsoft is to be blamed, you think that. Now, I'm not touching anything now. Uh, so, uh, Carol Post gave a very good introduction to my talk. In fact, she gave my talk. <laughs> I even say that. <laughs> But uh, okay, I think I can probably start seriously now. Um, uh, well, I don't know. It's like now we escape. Oh, damn. Are we too quickly? It's frozen. At least you know the first slide now. <laughs> There you go, the talk is there. Okay. It was just like reading all this stuff. And now we have a black screen. Okay. I did give that talk before, so it's like I know it can work, but I think Carol showed essentially the same structure and for a long time this is the the structure that was helping me to um, to uh, talk about and understand the regulation of, of SART in the structure of Frank, actually, who is uh, my chair. Okay. So, and this is a, a cartoon that I uh, took the liberty to take out of a paper uh, that I was part of with John. And this is the uh, down-regulated, inactive form. This is in 2001, I think this really reflected the view of how this is working. So you have the down-regulated form. This was a cartoon of picturing an active form where some of these um, um, auto-inhibitory interaction have been sort of uh, relieved. And so therefore, the, this SH2, SH3 clamp is, is uh, disengaged from the catalytic domain. And now this uh, uh, activation loop is popped open. The helix alpha C is rotated, and you're active. So, this was a cartoon and trying to understand that. Now, um, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about is trying to basically has been my, my working hard to try to understand how to, to, uh, to picture that cartoon in my head. And uh, one, one piece of information that sort of showed up a few years uh, ago is a fully activated, although in the paper they say partially activated because the um, activation loop is not phosphorylated for the Therosine 416 is not phosphorylated. This is a cohen jacob structure. So it's activated in the sense that the helix is rotated and the E310 with the K295 uh, salt bridges form and, and the loop is open, but it's not phosphorylated, which is a little quirky. Um, and then they got that structure. So now we have two structures. Of, so this one used to be called the assembled state. And when I 
sort of talk about it, I call this one the reassemble state, because it's definitely not a disassemble, so call it reassemble. I hope there's not we have a third one and I will run out of name. But essentially these are the, the two pictures that I have. And now you ask yourself, well, presumably the regulatory machinery, SHU, SH3, is there to prevent activation. And one way to ask that question would be to say, well, if I could, at the molecular level, really guarantee and ensure that these interactions never leave, are really always engaged there, how hard is it to actually activate the, the activation loop? And presumably, uh, this regulatory machinery is making it harder to go to this state. If this was all in place, now this is a hypothetical state, if nobody's ever seen this, but hypothetically, if this is still there, this transition should be hard. Um, you could say similarly, uh, sort of rebuild that cartoon with the same pieces. You see, if you take the cohen jacob structure, which is supposed to be partially activated or, or activated, uh, you could say, well, now the, this state, the active state, should be pr uh, more promoted and actually could be, make it harder to go to the downregulated confirmation for the loop, assuming the rest is in that particular cartoonish confirmation. And if you want to pose that question at the molecular level in the kind of thing that we do, then the first thing to do is to say, well, how hard is it to do that in the catalytic domain alone, just to begin with? And then I can start to plug in these other uh, modules and ask myself, well, do they make it harder or more difficult? And so this is why uh, I worked on that, and I, Carol has also worked on that. It's not only that it makes the system smaller, so therefore more amenable to simulation, but this is basically the baseline to understand everything else you're going to see after that. So you want to understand that. So you say, well, we know experimentally, if you take the uh, catalytic domain alone by itself, that it will sort of be uh, constitutively active. Right? That's, that's, that's the fact. However, uh, what does that really mean? Is that, well, all these tyrosine uh, 416 are going to get transphosphorylated by other kinase, and then at the end, in your beaker, you'll have fully active kinase. That doesn't mean they all activated all spontaneously. That means there was a process to activate them. So therefore, it's, it is making sense to think of the catalytic domain alone also in isolation as having accessible, uh, an access to the state that's inactive as well. So even though this is not the one that you would imagine is dominant over a long time, it's possible to imagine this state existing. Therefore, this state also exists too. Now, like Carol, we also have done some Go models. The, the main reason why we did them uh, was, I think these Go models are these carbon alpha traces where you have uh, a mimicry of uh, the native interaction. And in, in my view of that was mostly to play it's basically like you know going around the block with your bicycle with the training wheels on. You you don't have as much burden with explicit solvent and everything. Nonetheless, the formal machinery of how you're going to look at what's going on is pretty much the same. You know, uh, so so we did the uh, a a, bice, a two state go model. So that means the go model normally has only one stable basin, but it's possible to extend these approaches uh, to have more than one uh, basin. So this is when you have only one basin accessible. This was, I can't see from you. This is the inactive basin. And these are a number of uh, native contacts. This is the active basin. And when you put this kind of uh, effective mixing of the two potential surfaces, and you start to have access to the two basins. And if you play with how much you mix the two surfaces, you can have either a very large barrier between them or a smaller barrier with different features, which tells you that you know this is really a Mickey Mouse cartoon of reality. This is not. This is not going to be quantitative because energy barriers are basically at the at the turn of a knob are changing by tens of kcal. It, 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 there's no uh, atomistic reality in there. Nonetheless, you have the connectivity of the chain. That's important topology, and you have the excluded volume. So atoms and residue can't pass across each other. So as far as a cartoonish model, at least it has some reality, and so you can play with this. And uh, so we ran a very long simulation, actually several long simulations, which uh, that was done mostly by Si Chun Yang, and then we, we cluster the results of those confirmations. That means we, we harvest all those and we put together the one that looked like, and these are all these dots. And uh, clustering has been done before, but uh, inspired by what Bill Swope and uh, John Codera and Ken Dill are doing, 
We also monitor the transitions between the clusters doing all these trajectories, and every line here is a, a transitions between these different clusters. And the way we draw that cluster is actually if the transitions are more frequent, the line is shorter. So the like uh, circles that are close mean that they exchange fast, and if they're far away, they exchange more slowly. This is more slowly. So this is the inactive, and this is the active cluster essentially. And you can see there's two two main pathways to go. In, in this model, you could go from the inactive to active through this kind of straight pathway, or you can go through this pathway. And when you analyze that, you find that actually the straight pathway is the pathway that we sort of see in targeted dynamics type of thing, where you force the loop to open up and the helix to rotate, whereas this other pathway is, is perhaps more like a, the outcome of a Go model approach, is if there is a partial cracking or unfolding of the end terminus uh, load, the end load. Um, I don't know if this is completely wacko to imagine that this thing could happen. I would like to have some experiments that would test that, perhaps some uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange, you know, over different times. You could see whether this is more prone to be uh, cracking up sometime and try to see. So it's possible. I, I think it's conceivable to test that. Um, until then, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to say this is a complete uh, hypothesis. As no, uh, there's no proof that this exists. Now, once you have all this, you can also sort of project the entire statistics of all this because we know the probabilities of all these uh, states as well as the rates. So we can project them on, on, on different uh, uh, coordinates. For example, you can look at motion of the loop and uh, rotation of the alpha c helix, and you can see that when you're here, you're in the inactive state, and you can basically move the loop quite a bit until you have to jump and then rotate the helix. So they're kind of really uncorrelated. Uh, when you rotate the helix, you also enforce a different conformation in the end terminus. You know. So these are already kind of qualitatively indicative of the things we will want to see in the larger uh, all atom models. Now, one thing that is true is if you leave the catheter domain alone in solution, it will trans uh, phosphorate, or two phosphorate by, by a, a trans process. The trans process meaning is another kinase that comes in a bimolecular encounter and phosphorylate that loop. So anytime you think of that, that means the loop has to be at least open enough so that the tyrosine is accessible for this. So here, uh, this is a work that Nilesh Banavali did. We try to construct two endpoints. Well, one point, one endpoint is just the inactivated uh, conformation of the catheter domain. The other one is a sort of hypothetical intermediate state where the helix has not rotated, but we're opening up the loop a little bit, as in the active domain. And so and then we relax those by molecular dynamics, and then you get, of course, this is relaxed like the inactive. This is relaxed like some sort of unseen experimentally state where the loop is open, but the helix has not rotated. And we use this as a reference to do umbrella sampling. So uh, we did many runs, and uh, this is a very difficult problem to, to uh, sample, right? So the, the PMF, the, the potential mean force when you compute it, is not always the same depending on how you combine your results. Like if we try to open um, and generate all the windows as we open, we find that the blue state here, the deep uh, stable state, is the uh, um, inactive state. And there's another state here that is sort of partially open. If we start from the open state and we try to bring it down to the closest, we actually don't find that state. We still find that minimum, but we don't find the other state. If you combine everything, you find that you have two minimum is a bistable system. I don't really know what is the relative free energy of those two states. I think they both exist, obviously. Um, so that means this state is a free energy minimum uh, with the tyrosine exposed, um, but the helix has not rotated. Now we try to pursue this beyond that by um, <coughs> using again the technique that Carol mentioned, this targeted dynamics. So we have started from the fully inactive catalytic domain and we drag it to the fully active. So that was done in one sweep, like something like 10 nanoseconds. And then along that trajectory, we monitored at which distance we were in terms of our root mean square deviation with respect to the two endpoints. And we ended up with about 79 uh, structures in between the transition, which we constrained to be at these different positions. We, we constrained them, and then we ran more dynamics for another several nanoseconds. 
Then we release them. And so now we have 79 structures that have been relaxed, that are laying out between the two endpoints. And now there are free trajectories. And we ran that, that was 79 trajectories, and we clustered them. So this is about 23 clusters. So we didn't, we didn't have to cluster them in 79. Of course, we clustered them in less states. So this is a bit like what we did uh, with the Go model. But this would be like a, a finer grain clustering of that straight pathway that we had before. The, 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 the unfolding of the NLO is like another pathway, which we're going to ignore for now. This is more like the straight pathway. And you can see there's a fine structure to it. And when you look at it, we, we define that there's sort of two, two um, nexus of state. It seems, so this is the nexus. So there's a nexus of state here. And there's another state here that uh, you don't see on that plot, but you're going to see why I mean that. And this is the active state. And I think we basically can imagine uh, that we can, we can have a representative trajectory of the entire transition from that, essentially. We have 78 trajectories of, of um, I don't know, uh, one, uh, 15, 12, 12, 15 nanoseconds. It's about one microsecond total. And so we cluster all that. You can analyze it in different ways. For example, uh, on that, that uh, uh, network of states, you can plot how much the loop is open. So you can see this is blue, it means the loop is absolutely not open, and red means it's as open as it went up. I am pretty loud anyway. It was resonating because I, I know this clock. And so I don't know. It's like the sound is coming from everywhere in the room. So, uh, so here you have. You see, red means it's as open as possible. And you can see it's kind of interesting that as soon as you leave the dark blue, right here at this intermediate, you're already in the green, which is the. You know, you're going behind. Uh, um, you're you're trained behind that linear scale already. And the red is only at the very last, so you open pretty fast. On the other end, the helix rotation order parameter, you can see you leave the inactivated state, and here you're still kind of cyan, you're still blue, which means you're trailing behind. So the loop opens faster than the helix rotates, which what people see in targeted dynamics, but this is not targeted dynamics, it's more like a clustering thing. So it's actually uh, interesting to see that if you compare the loop motion and the helix rotation, they don't occur at the same time. Now it's possible to, to use all the information for that cluster, let me go back, to use all those states. Now we have a probability, an estimate of the probability of all those states from the Markov transition between all those states. And uh, what we do is, of course we don't have enough information to map the free energy surface, but what we do is actually we convolute them with a kind of uncertainty, a smearing function that's a Gaussian little bit in the spirit of the metadynamics of uh, Michel Parinello, if you know what I mean. If you don't know, that's not important. But basically, we are able to construct a tentative free energy surface, which co corresponds to the opening of the loop and the helix rotation. And dark blue here is the uh, free energy minimum that corresponds to inactive. And you can see there's a first intermediate state here that means the loop is open. But the helix has essentially not rotated yet. And now you're going to rotate the helix more and open the loop. So there's really like a first step where you move the loop but you don't move the helix. Let me remind you that this is actually pretty similar to what we had with the Go model. The Go model also, that of course, in a much more crude and caricatural way, but it's very similar. Um, another thing you can look at is these, uh, the free energies of the salt bridges that Carol talked about the E310 joining with the K295, and you can see the, 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 the initial and final structures, but you can see also how they actually are joining together. And uh, it is true that basically, it's a bit like passing the baton in a, in a relay uh, race, you know. You actually don't break the salt bridge and then reform another one, you actually pass it along. Right? And you can see the hydrophobic core melting uh, just, um, let's see, Yes, just that it, there is a buried part of the activation loop that sort of touches the helix a little bit. So it's a bit misleading to talk about just the loop as if the loop. Actually, there's a buried part of the loop that's pretty intimately interacting with the helix, which forms a big hydrophobic cluster. And that thing sort of melts as you go to the activated state. So you can see this hydrophobic cluster melting slowly. And of course, there's a tryptophan uh, 260 that sort of 
is locked up against the helix, and as you go to the inactivated, the full activated state is rotated. Um, one thing that, that we haven't really explored very deeply, but I think that's putatively interesting, is to examine uh, the docking of, of uh, ligands and inhibitors to these intermediates that we discover out of that procedure. And um, one thing we just did is try to just dump in the known inhibitors into the, the different intermediates. If you dump the inhibitors into the inactive state, we have a lot of bad contact. But if you dump them into the uh, intermediate states, you have less bad contact, which means that the, loop is, the, the pocket is a bit more open. It might be more permissive to load that. And even the second intermediate is even uh, less bad contact, actually, than the, the inactive state. So that, that means it's, you know, that could be an, an interesting uh, uh, target for uh, drug, uh, drug docking. Now, Okay, so these are the three main elements, the loop, the helix alpha C, and the N-terminus. And uh, I just talked to you about what happens when you try to open the loop and uh, activate the catalytic domain. But in the, in the broader context, we'd like to understand what happens with the regulatory domain. Now, we, we haven't simulated the kinase with those domains, but we can try to perceive what would be the effect. Imagine that you have the helix there, you have your tryptophan 260. Actually, this is joining with the N-terminus that dies down behind the kinase and will bind to the SH2 domain. When you go to the active states, the tryptophan has actually changed its orientation, and the N-terminus also changed its orientation. And uh, so this is what it looks like. You have these three elements. And the way I think the information, that agrees with Carol, is that I think the way the information carries from the catalytic site, the active site, down to the regulatory domain is in part via the tryptophan 260, but this is transmitted through the N-terminus, which is not just a flexible piece of peptide, it's actually more um, um, reactive than that, in the sense that it, uh, it adopts different conformation. So Nilesh Badavali had done uh, earlier some free energy calculation where you imagine that you lock the kinase into an active state or an inactivated state, and then you do the free energy profile um, of the N-terminus alone uh, with respect to a coordinate that takes you from this um, uh, conformation that swings down or the conformation that sort of swings back up because of the, the tryptophan uh, having changed its conformation. So if you have the body of the kinase in the inactivated form, the free energy uh, surface tells you that the minimum the absolute minimum there as the N-terminus diving down towards the, uh, the, the rest of the kinase. So even though this calculation is done just on the catalytic domain alone, if you try to reconstruct the SH2, SH3 where it ought to be, it, they would actually naturally fall where they would want to be when the kinase is inactivated, which means that this piece of peptide, the N-terminus, constitutively knows its conformation, and it's completely compatible with having the SH2, SH3 clamp uh, on the back end of the catalytic domain. Now, if you activate the body of the kinase and the helix is rotated, the free energy surface of the N-terminus is changed. And now you, you don't have that minimum anymore. You don't even have a, a, a shift of equilibrium. The minimum has disappeared. So you, you don't have that minimum. You will slide down to this conformation. There's some fluctuation there, but it's more uh, uh, permissive. You know, and this is close to the uh, X-ray structure, actually, of the cohen jacob that we had seen after we had done these calculations, but it's close to that confirmation. So, so if you try to reconstruct now the um, uh, uh, SH2, SH3 domain with a, a population of states that you extract from that, this is what you get. And you see that there are a few states that would be compatible with bringing the SH2 down to the, the bottom of the catalytic domain, but there, there are just a few of those. And by and large, you have many that are uh, just fluctuating around. So it means that there are less states now that are compatible. And uh, so that means there is a correlation between the, the uh, helix rotation and the confirmation that the N-terminus wants to adopt spontaneously. And that's also a bit indicative in the, uh, the Go model already. <coughs> so that's why we actually think that there is, this is the pathway for the communication, is through the N-terminus. So if I show again, this free energy surface that we did on the catalytic domain alone, 
it's possible to play that game again and reconstruct the regulatory domain on the back end, even though the simulation was not done with those. And so if you try to reconstruct the inactivated state, you find that actually they're very close to where they would be in the fully inactivated time. But when you go to the intermediate states, again, they're very compatible with that. When you go to the first uh, intermediate state, it starts to be less compatible. By the time you get to the active state, now it's much less compatible, which makes it suggest that when you imagine your C tail would be there phosphorylated and strongly bound to the SH2, these two guys, the yellow and green guy, could be there all the time and without preventing that conformational transition, because this transition here is going to occur even though the regulatory domain are clamped on the back. There's nothing really to stop that from happening. Now, what's interesting is that if you look along the, the, all the clusters of states that we have here, the solvent exposure of tyrosine 416, it is buried only at the very early stage, like in the inactive state, where it's blue here. But as soon as you go to the intermediate state, you're red. You're basically fully solvent exposed. So the tyrosine that's here is as fully exposed <coughs> by the end here. So that means that it's conceivable that if you have the fully uh, assembled kinase, even with the C-phosphorylated thing, that if you leave it in the beaker enough, there will be a transphosphorylation event that will slowly activate that kinase, because the loop will just open enough, will act as a substrate for another kinase, and so on and so forth. This It's almost like a gear to be able to do that. Now, the thing that we've done so far has been, uh, is this me beeping? That was 25 minutes. That was the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but Carol gave that talk, so I can probably skip that part. You know, so far what we did is this, this clustering, and you know, I think that the results are very suggestive, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about you know, this last thing that I presented just uh, before, but it's still very difficult to manage in terms to get quantitative free energies. Like, for example, if you really wanted to redo that calculation with truly the regulatory domain in the different position, I'm not so sure we can we will get quantitative precision. So we developed this other method called the string method, which uh, is still very much in its early development. Really, it's a method where you have you start on some tentative transition path and you're able to refine it. What it means, every one of those blue dots along the path is actually a copy of the full system that you run for molecular dynamic selection. So that means that when you do a, a transition path or something like that, in principle, you have 25, 30, 40 molecular dynamic simulation of HCK that are running somewhere. So the nice thing is that each one of those don't really talk very much, so it's very trivially parallelized. Um, and so the way it works is that you, you just... Um, run your different simulations, you let them go for free, so that's why you uh, get these swarm trajectories, you get the average displacement, you recorrect your, your position of your beads, and when you do that, it gives, this is actually the light algorithm, when it does it, it actually is able to drift towards the good path on a toy surface. So uh, this is the algorithm. It's a modification of the algorithm of Eric Van den Eigen and, and Giovanni Cicotti, uh, because in their original formulation, you have to use holonomic constraints. Giovanni is holonomic constraints, so obviously that's what they implemented. And they have to deal with horrible Jacobians and things, which ever since I was an undergraduate student, I don't like, so I try to avoid them. With the Swami trajectories, these things are incorporated automatically because the trajectories are just moving naturally, so you don't have these trouble. So this is the opening of the loop that uh, Wen Chong Gan a student in the lab has been doing, and this is like a, you can see actually the switching charge of, of Carol. You see this charge and boom, go there. This is like a piece of the, uh, the string method that's going on. Now, I, I have to, to talk about this rest of things that hopefully will go faster. So we go back to this cartoon of the fully exploded kinase, which is still uh, very much in question. I told you that this N-terminus is, is far from this little brown string here, actually as it is a, a, a transformative structural element, flexible, more flexible than the, these folded domain, but it is definitely not just an entirely flexible piece of peptide. It, it's a bit similar with this connector as well, and uh, you know, what about the connector? And, and John has, has worked on that, so we can, one thing we can check is actually 
what are the uh, relative conformation of the SH2, SH3 domains together in different contexts to start to learn about that. And so if you look at the fully assembled kinase, and this is a free energy surface with respect to the distance between the two domains, and this is a kind of RMSD that tells you about the orientation. The coordinates are not particularly important for what you have to see here. You see there's a deep free energy well when you're fully assembled. Now, I'm going to remove the C tail. Uh, remove the C tail here, and now you have this surface. You see, I was here before, and now the minimum has just extended a little bit. So it means when you remove the C tail, you don't really start to blow apart. You actually, the free energy minimum is still quite well defined. Now I remove the catalytic domain altogether, but I keep the polyproline peptide, which is leading no normally to the N-terminus. Now this is getting to be more and more interesting. You see, we were here, and now the minimum is here. So that means that when you put this element into the back end of the catalytic domain, there is a loaded spring phenomenon because you will have to bring this here. That's actually, this thing is a loaded spring. It's a bit peculiar. I mean, it's sort of, it means if you're going to pop it, it will want to pop. It will want to, you know, leave it. Now, if you remove this polyproline and have just a connector, we would have thought that it would just go over the, the world, but in fact it doesn't. You open a little bit more fluctuation, but this is essentially where uh, we were fluctuating before, and the folded domain in the full assembled kinase is here. So even SH2, SH3 alone, with nothing, truly remembers the confirmation it wants to have in the fully assembled kinase. So this is, again, another element that is not just a connector that is featureless. It's pretty, um, so if you put all that together, you see, when you go from the fully disassembled kinase to fully assembled, you have a kind of a funnel. And little by little, you approach the deep minimum. But at every stage, when you disengage one of the regulatory elements, you just have a broader surface to float on. <coughs> um, this also relates to the glycine that were mutated in the Young et al. paper, basically, where correlation between the two domains disappeared when we put glycines. And uh, so we, we redid that with the glycine titillation. So it's a, this is just as a uh, comparison. This is the y type I showed you before, the fully assembled kinase. And this is the fully assembled kinase, but with four glycine in the connector. And you see, the surface is a bit broader, but not a whole lot. Now if you do just the SH2, SH3 alone, without the cathetic domain, meaning that we represent this as the fully disassociated state, or disassembled, this is what you see. This is what we saw before with the wild type. We were still pretty focused in this region. But when you put glycine, now all of a sudden you can go all over the place. So that means when you put the glycine in this connector, the fully disassembled state is very different. The, the folded state itself is not extremely different. Although it's difficult to appreciate these differences in terms of the impact on the inhibitory, uh, inhibiting the catalytic domain. But definitely the disassembled state is pretty different. And uh, I mean, to be back again to say, like, well, what do we really know about all these things in solution? So we started to uh, do some experiment, God forbid, uh, which not have been possible without the help of uh, uh, Marcus and John, who gave us their construct and plasmid and everything. So this is just. My first gel that I'm showing you, uh, uh, the kinase is actually well uh, expressed uh, by the tech, uh, the deal of Lacoeli, and high, uh, high, high uh, quality. You can really, this is a fantastic uh, method to you know, get a lot of kinase in, in E. coli, so uh, no need to have insect cells here. And this is a solution scattering data. Now, a little parenthesis on solution scattering was done by Citroen John. Uh, solution scattering is to be easy or hard to interpret depending on how you uh, regard it. Like if you have, uh, you want to go to very high resolution, like wide angle scattering, uh, you, you may need to have all atom models for the protein and all atom models for the solvent. And this is a uh, methodology that was developed recently by San Yun Park. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, we can compare, in red is the, um, the experiment and in blue is the data. Uh, uh, no, I mean, in red is the experiment, in blue is the calculation. And you see that even to pretty high Q, we fit the slice design amazingly well, even in the small region. There's no adjustable parameter whatsoever in this. Zero. It's just like straight out of the box 
no no uh, adjustment. But this is not really nice for analyzing the kinase because it's, it, it requires too much detail, so we use a more coarse grain approach. So this is again the lysozyme design with the hydration shell, and Sichun worked out a kind of form factor per residue for a kind of go-type model, so you just have a form factor per residue. And here we compare with, uh, for lysozyme with the data, and it's been able to analyze, now this is again the HCK I showed you before, so he's able to fit the uh, scattering profile, so we ran the Go model over uh, many, many states, and we clustered them, and once we've clustered them, now we, we try to fit the probability of each cluster to fit the data, so you have this cluster one, is pretty much around the X3 structure, cluster two is almost like the X3 structure, but the SH3 are sort of wagging a little bit away because the C tail has fallen off, and, yeah, and so on and so forth. This one is pretty much a cohen jacob structure, and th these are the probability that you fit. The error bars are actually the uncertainty on the fit, and you can see that this, this is the crystal structure, and this is the uncertainty, so basically 58% is the crystal structure, about 30% is this kind of wagging <coughs> state. If you put these two together, it's about 90%, these two states. Now this, uh, the C tail is not phosphorylated, this is just a straight kinase with no phosphorylation, so uh, interesting to see that it is actually close to that state. Now, we <coughs> believe this, well, we did more, we collaborated with Pancho Vizinia to do FRET, so there's some cysteine, one in SH2 and in the cathetic domain, when it's in this, uh, this state here, it's about 30 angstrom here, and so they did FRET, you find two exponential, one is a fast one, which is the <coughs> short distance, and one is the slow one, which is the long distance, 58 angstrom would mean this thing would be somewhere far away, and they get 80% of the the fast, which means it would be 80% of the assembled state, which is very consistent with the solution scattering. So, I don't know, this is working a bit too well. Um, we also then did more solution scattering to examine uh, the assembly state of the kinase by soaking the kinase with a competitive polyproline peptide that will bind to the SH3 and break the thing. So, the red and black data here is the fully kind, the full assembled kinase we did before. And the line that goes below the magenta is with the polyproline peptide. We also put the C tail, but that, that, that did not make a difference. The green one is also here. So you see this, we have not uh, analyzed this in terms of uh, structures yet, but you can see that radius gyration is actually much larger. You know. And so the, the kinase is more exploded. And in fact, uh, the FRET says the same thing, that when you soak the system with the polyproline peptide, uh, the uh, slow part starts to increase, the population of slow parts starts to increase, and in fact the turning point is around 10 micromolar, which is not too far from the binding of polyproline peptide to SH3, so I actually expected it would be harder to dislodge that from there, but apparently not. So my global view of how this is going right now is to try to understand this, this kinase. Is we all know that the business end is here in terms of the catalysis, and this loop has to open and close. And uh, the hypothesis, I guess, would be how hard or how, what is the influence of the regulatory machinery on the opening and closing of the loop? Does it make it impossible? Or does it make it just harder? Is it more in terms of a, a shift of equilibrium uh, picture versus an all or nothing picture? I don't really know. So we know that we can do the transition in the isolated catalytic domain. I'd be very curious to see what is the impact of that? My hunch, and what Carol says is also, it's, it's actually not dramatically impeding. Huh? So, so this is what we want to see. Um, now, these, these uh, configuration of SH2, SH3 is one position that's seen in the crystal structure. There are other positions, and perhaps there are a few others that are um, less well populated, so we're going to carry on some uh, solution scheduling to try to uh, under different conditions, <coughs> to try to identify these other intermediates to see how much uh, different configuration of those regulatory domains exist. And each time these regulatory domains are interacting with these uh, self inhibitory uh, interaction, you know, with their target sequence. So you have to compare that probably with binding in vitro of just the binding of a peptide with a, of a domain. Just see, presumably those are stronger because one would say locally the concentration is higher, but it's not. It's not always that clear, so um, 
yeah, I, I, I'm at this point, this is more like a hypothesis to try to see where, where this is going to lead us. And um, I guess I should conclude with this and uh, impose on you my, my conclusion without reading it. So thanks a lot. You, I mean, neither you nor Carol are looking at phosphorylated activation loop. So if you just take out the activation loop entirely, it doesn't make any difference in your calculations. Because when you phosphorylate it, and you, neither of you also consider the HRD, that arginine, which has got to be a dominant electrostatic interaction when you have <coughs> in that way. I mean, that part, I don't know how stable, how stable is... You mean that's the arginine that's on the unit? The no, it's the arginine right before the, the catalytic oh. um, base. And like, Certainly in PKA, if you don't have the phosphate on the activation that the whole protein is less stable. Yours may not be because you can stabilize it in the inactive state like that. How stable is the kinase? You mean if we cut the loop off? For your calculations, just cut the loop off. I don't think it would make a difference at all. Because you're not looking, the end state is going to be when it's phosphorylated. And how stable is that loop either in or out when, when it's not phosphorylated? I would answer that. Yeah, I think, I, mean, I, I, I I would agree with you that you know if we cut out this uh, the solid exposed part of the loop, that's not going to have a huge impact. Uh, there is a buried part of the loop that really is uh, okay. binding to the yield. How stable is that inside? Well, it's, yeah, it's where do you stop calling it the loop? Because it's actually there is like a, you know a six, seven, eight residue that are sort of about below the alpha <coughs> that are coming out from the loop. So those are. Those are really important, I think. Uh, um, well, the thing is that, you know, if the problem with the phosphorylation is that it has to occur after the loop must have been opened. So, because it can't happen when the, I mean, it's not autophosphorylated cysts, so it can't happen when you're in the pocket. It must happen when the loop is open. So we've done some calculation, some simulation with the phosphorylation. What happened is that if you just leave it phosphorylated, but you don't bring it close to the active state, it may even happen that the phosphate will plunge back into the cavity and start to fight with the magnesium. And it's not so clear whether this is a complete artifact of simulation or this game is more complex than we think. But uh, right now we, we, we're dealing with everything but the phosphorylation because I figured that a lot of this regulatory process is before. For me, that's the end game. Once you get there, that's like on the other side of the fence. I, will, I won't want to touch that. Not for, not for now. I think Carol had a comment. Well, I, I was just going to say that, the, that we did have looked at that arginine, and it, and it, I mean, you're right, it does have to stabilize the active state more than the inactive state. Yeah. But as far as the transition between the two, it doesn't seem to switch in the way the other residents of residues do. It, it, there's, there's a hydrogen bond that is now forming, it would have been the phosphate, <coughs> but it doesn't move hand off the way. But you're looking at moving without the phosphate, and you must shift the equilibrium strongly in the other way once you have the phosphate. Out. So you're just looking at this. It thing. is true that, you know, if you look at the real activated crystal structure where there is the phosphate making a solid bridge with, the, I think it's an arginine, yes. in the fully activated state, that contact is not so stable when you don't have the phosphate. So there's... Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, so there, of course, what we call the, the active light, I should call it the active light confirmation rather than activated confirmation because you're, you, all the atoms are in the position, but there's no phosphate on the entire thing. But that arginine is part of this, it's very stable, it's right next to the slime residue, it's not going to change at all, it's a very stable arginine. So when you, when you put the phosphate on, that's got to be a big factor. Yeah. Okay. Well, John, well, did you? <coughs> or, sorry. Yeah, I have a very technical question. So, in general, what you set up uh, in the microbiome simulation, the, the, the initial conditions are critical. <coughs> now you set uh, the initial condition and the final condition, A and B. Plus, you put strings in the trajectories. Now that you limit in a lot, the confirmation space allows you to move on to the you know, sample <coughs> states that maybe are not described by your trajectories. And, well, most of, I, I described the string method. I didn't show you a lot of results from the string method today. Uh, but the string method, in principle, when you read the paper of Eric van den Eigen and others, they talk about the path between two, two states. But in, in real complex systems, 
these energy circuits are much more rugged, and there probably are multiple paths, parallel and breaking away in multiple channels. So it's possible to conceive a, a, um, a, a kind of annealing procedure where you would warm up the string and anneal it back and warm it up and get multiple paths. And so you're not limited to one path. You can actually look at multiple paths and try to combine all that information later. It's possible to do that. And was there a question over here? Well, this is actually almost the same, same question that you raised. Obviously, you're thinking in, in, in the same way I, I, I think it's important. Um, you know, the, this issue of cracking, which comes up, um, and, you know, every time Jose or I talk about it, people go, oh, that's very interesting, but that can't be. Because <laughs> we're so used to thinking that there's only one path uh, in between, uh, even though we're very used to thinking there's lots and lots of states of unfolded perfect. So, I, I think that that's really the, the sort of key question on the theoretical side. It seems like you're already at the stage where you could begin to answer it. You could deliberately move away from that one set of paths you had in the middle. You found one connected path. You could find ones that are at least farther away and see if they move back to it or, or not. Well, one thing about you know, experimentally, if somebody could do like hydrogen deuterium exchange and then do mass spec or something, if you find that you can exchange proton in the core of this N load, that would mean that it has unfolded at least partially. It's, it's been done, and the answer is you do. It's been done? Yeah. Who showed that? Well, I don't know if it's been done for exactly the kinase you're studying, but for every kinase I've ever looked at, the N load exchange is a whole lot quicker than the C load. Oh my gosh, I should have known that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't leave the room. The <laughs> reference. <laughs> But it's even more when it's not phosphorylated on the activation. Is that right? So that would mean that, well, I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, one thing that I felt a bit uncomfortable about this is that <laughs> the inactive state is still dominant when you have the kinetic domain alone, number one. But you can open up to the fully active. Now, we have about 80% of the population is in the fully inactive. You can reach the active state to about 10% according to our free energy map, which is very uh, inaccurate. It's, uh, but, but has anyone tested that? That's my, my question. That you said that 80% of the time, even in the tail, unfortunately, yeah. it's really retained the inactive state. Yes. Yes. Sort of sort of. Yes. Now, has anyone in the tyrosine panel still started your system? I think Marcus was saying he's it Has anyone that. really done it to you? What's the difference but between... between between that um, that state, which is we cut off the zero-free domain entirely, just yeah. have the uh, activation, the, the catalytic domain, what's the difference in, in that uh, activity? Uh, so that's one question. And, and the second thing I'll comment on Susan, that I mean, there's a difference for the listening to all this talk. I don't know that much about priority kind of thing. The phosphorylation, the activation loop is not exact. There's something different between she used during the tyrosine because in both she used during kinases, when you really require to have a phosphorylation activation loop, that is absolutely essential. Tyrosine kinases have some activity. Even yes, it's true. Right? Yes. So, so there is a difference. So, you're talking about this, uh, this ionic interaction with this HRB and uh, arginine versus this here. Yeah. And the serine gene kinases is absolutely essential. So, my question to you have you really compared? You know, the kinase, uh, the no, I, and yeah. I've not compared with other kinases. Uh, it is, I know there's a vast body of, of knowledge there, and by comparative calculation, you can learn more. We, this is already pretty heroic, I believe, <laughs> to, to carry one system like that. It's very difficult at this moment. I think you know if these things. This this represents the you know the work of Nilesh and Sichun over like three or four years. If this could be carried out over, let's say, three or four days, then you start to do, then you can say, okay, let's do five systems and compare them. You can do a, a different range of but questions. And, and these are has done it, I believe, in CKA, for example. They can comment on it. But how about this activation loop? We yeah. say we change it to the phosphorylation versus unphosphorylation versus your sheet. Uh, that is again. One thing you have to realize also is that when we do these calculations, the way we gear them, is that we often start from a, 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 a confirmation that's experimentally known, but then we actually try to go to transition to virtual states that are not really seen, but we imagine must exist because you can't have just a transition from the X-ray structure inactive to the X-ray structure active. There's got to be a lot of things going on. So we conceptually divided the system into different parts, 
And then we're looking at these transitions for virtual states. So if you say, oh, well, it's known that this, is, this does not exist, we say, okay, it does not exist, maybe it does not exist for long enough to actually have an impact experimentally when you measure it, but I sort of need it formally. I mean, it, it, conceptually, you cannot avoid that in some of those states, otherwise the, the system doesn't, you, you have no uh, conceptual uh, framework to, to pose any question. So say. I think, first of all, those days are not virtual, right? They're just, they're, they're, you just can't measure them because they're not occupied. The other thing I wanted to bring about it is uh, when you have cracking, you don't have cracking on a stable basis. You have cracking on the transition. So it's very hard for you to tell me that you're going to do like hydrogen exchange and things and, and sort of equilibrium experiments to measure that. That's what I was talking about uh, functional phi values and other sort of masses that are sensitive to the transition state. Now, just out of your heart, you told me that you think that uh, the past that goes through cracking is a hypothesis. Yeah. How about the direct one? Is that also a hypothesis? <laughs> What's the experimental evidence supporting that more than the other one? That's true. You know, uh, I would say, with my preconceived notion, it looks like uh, more plausible. Certainly, I know that when I talk to my colleagues and peers, there's less mental opposition to it. <laughs> but that is not a proof that it's more correct. But, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm uh, certainly, you know, if we were going to deal with that with all atom molecular dynamics, this unfolding cracking path is extremely hard to imagine. Uh, it's like, I don't even know which order parameter to look at anymore. It's much more difficult. Whereas the other one is more like, okay, a more traditional type of conformational change. So and even that, I mean, light, when right? I started to work on this conformational change when <laughs> John was still in New York, uh, around 2001, 2002, I didn't have expect it would be that hard. Even though this is just like opening of a loop and rotation of an helix. And believe me, it is really difficult. There's a lot of stuff that just doesn't come to be so easy to... You know, I, I thought we would be doing umbrella sampling on that transition like six years ago and be done with it. And it's much harder than that. But that's because the free energy surface is so complex. It's very rugged, there's probably more than one path, and it's just extremely hard to sample that. So they want your scattering. Did you show your slide where you had like six? Oh, this one? If anybody no, wants to grab a copy. <laughs> <laughs> one back, where you fit. Uh, <laughs> you mean this one? That one. Yeah. So th this is this is your scattering. This is solution scattering on HCK. For phosphorylated. No, nothing's phosphorylated. Yeah. Completely unphosphorylated. Com completely unphosphorylated, and it's dominated by this guy and this guy. So you know, Miguel promised. Yeah. Scattering. Well, it's very good. Yeah, there's a GMB paper on CSAR. Yeah, I think did they say they have like 30% of this? Like 80 or 90, but then the other one is your Y1. One Y5. Well, we don't have to prove that this is, we, this is, it's here. I mean, it's at the noise level. So his results are... Well, I'm, you know, I'd say when we start to work on the solution scattering a year ago, I, we read a lot of papers and then we developed our own methods. So I guess you get, you get what I mean by that. So, well, I guess I don't know. I guess that's what I'm asking, is when you fit these curves, yeah. there are always going to be multiple ways to Oh, it's true. No, the fit is not unique, but uh, these error bars, I mean, the way I, we did the fit is a kind of a Monte Carlo. So it's not just a least square fit. It's actually a Monte Carlo on the parameters. And uh, for example, the population of this guy and this guy are a bit correlated. Like you could force this guy to disappear completely, and then this guy would become about 80%. But the fit would be less good. Yeah, but it's kind of hard to see what, how you... Why okay, let's take a short coffee break and then yeah. we'll...